When I started this retrospect, there were a couple games that I was looking forward to, such as Shin Megami Tensei If, Strange Journey, and the subject of today's video, Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. Strap in, folks, because this is going to be an interesting one. On September 20th, 2016, Megaton fans were introduced to Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. And damn, this was a divisive one. Now, I need y'all to understand that all gaming franchises are bound to have divisive games. Even the most beloved franchises are vulnerable to this, like Yakuza 3, Zelda 2, and DMC Devil May Cry. But compared to those games, I've seen a lot of people being mixed on whether or not this is a good Megaton game. And if we're talking about gameplay, then I can argue that it's in the top 10. But when it comes down to the story, that is where a lot of people are meh about. Yet, regardless of what many people thought about this game then and even now, there's still people who like this game, and more recently, the fans' reception of it has been a little bit more positive. As for me, though, I'm not gonna lie, this was one of the other games in this retrospective that I was looking forward to. Not just because of the discourse surrounding it, though it, uh definitely played a part in it, but the main reason was because of the trailers, which piqued my interest like a motherfucker. Now, of course, I wasn't able to play this because, you know, 3DS stuff, but we're finally here now, you dig? On the development side of things, this game was developed as a means to not only explore more of the world of 4, but to also improve on elements of the gameplay, and the dev team responsible for 4 would largely remain the same, with some interesting changes. Satoshi Oyama, who originally was the main programmer for Ford, would become the director for this game, leaving Kazuyuki Yamai as the main producer. The GOAT Ryo Takazuka would become the lead composer, and Masayuki Doi would not only work on the character designs again, but was now the main demon designer for the series. Now, are these new designs any good? Yeah, because we are not at the worst yet. It's coming up soon. <laughs> now, what might just be the most person in this entire team was the game scenario writer Yusuke Miyata. Now if this name sounds familiar to you then it would be for the fact that he was the director for Bayonetta 3, which I can't say much about because I haven't played it yet, but judging how people were mixed on that game, uh, yeah. Other than that though, I am in no position to voice my feelings on the man because I'm not too familiar with the games that he's been a part of, but from what I've heard, uh, people seem not to be a fan of him. But there really isn't much left but to check out that story and see what the problem is. It's a no-brainer that I'm going to be spoiling this story rotten, but I will be leaving a timestamp if you don't want to know what happens in the story. Or if you do not care, you can just skip to the gameplay. Also, I will be doing things differently for the synopsis. Trust me, it'll make sense when we get to it. So, uh, this is interesting. Apocalypse isn't actually a direct sequel to 4, but more of a guiding game taking place in an alternate timeline where most of the events that happened in the original game happened here. This time we're playing as this kid named Nanashi, who alongside his childhood friend Asahi are trying to become hunters. Being under the guidance of Nikari and Manabu, we go through some lessons with one talking about an event known as God's Plan and the mysterious dome that formed over Tokyo. Afterwards, it's just a matter of world building, learning more and more about the day-to-day -day lives of people living in the underground, as well as the role of the Hunters Association, which is practically vital to Tokyo with the Rengagaya and the Shurakai having zero power. But during this, we end up getting some weird dreams about a dude named Akira, and in one particular dream, we end up seeing the process of the dome coming up. The next day, we tell Nakari about this and briefly learn that Akira wasn't exactly liked among hunters. Nonetheless, though, we end up going with Nakari and Manabu on a little combat lesson, where we end up being surrounded by a bunch of demons being led by Adramelik. He soon proceeds to murk Manabu, Nakari, and us, Nanashi. But just as we kick the bucket and begin roaming the underworld, we are met with the god of knowledge, Dagda, who is willing to bring us back to life in exchange for helping him out. Funny enough, you could just say no and get a game over. But that be way too short, so we end up accepting Dogda's proposition and become his god slayer. Whatever the fuck that means. We managed to push Azramelik back, and just as you think we'll have some time to understand what just happened, Asahi drags us around to prove to her dad that we're capable of being hunters. This results in us almost getting marked by Anil and to her later saved by Flynn and Isabu, with Flynn actually having a voice this time. Nice. 
After helping Flynn and Isabu, we're finally considered hunters, and we end up going on our first mission in the Fairy Forest, which leads to us meeting Navar, who is now a ghost, and Nozomi, the Fairy Queen. We also meet Donna, the mother of Dagda, who ends up keeping a close eye on us for reasons you'll learn soon. Afterwards, we're given another mission, this time from Odin. Yeah, who wants us to get rid of a seal and Kanada no Yashiro. Once there, we end up finding Sukuna Hikona, who's trying to stop Nanashi and Asahi from breaking a seal there. But just after defeating him and attempting to just dip after getting a bad feeling, we get cornered by Odin and Dada kicks control of Nanashi's body to fully rip the seal, releasing the gods of old. These guys are called the Divine Powers and is being led by Krishna, who makes a beeline to Ginza where Flint is. We head over there, but Krishna and the other demons have cornered him, and we see Krishna trying to persuade Flint to become his god slayer, even using Asahi as a hostage. Flint reluctantly agrees and is knocked out by Odin, and from here, Krishna creates a monstrosity named Shesha and vows to create a world of his own image and gives us until the full moon to either stop him or join him, thus ending the prologue of the game. Yeah, all of that was just the prologue alone, Jesus Christ. <laughs> From here, the story is pretty simple, being to stop Krishna and save Flynn, with a lot of the missions being stepping stones to that main goal. And anything story related are mostly relegated to the characters that we're going to be introduced to, and specific moments such as Lucifer and Merkaba seeking a ceasefire to deal with the divine powers. Now, I already mentioned Navarra and Nozomi, but there's other characters we meet like Hallelujah, and yes, that is his actual name. Hallelujah is a member of the Ashurakai who we meet early on to try to get components for the Seisha radar, with that mission also leading us to encountering fucking Medusa again, which is just great. The next character we meet is Gaston, who is basically Navar but even more of an asshole. He is a part of the Crusaders, Mikado's advanced fighting force, or in this case, one singular soldier, as Gaston is considered a one-man show. He is sent out to help fight Shesha and later joins the group to fight the Divine Powers. Finally, we meet Toki, an assassin for the Ring of Gaia who we work with to get into Tsukiji Konkanji, the ace cube for the Divine Powers. While trying to work with her to attempt to save Flynn, during the siege, we end up getting a couple things revealed to us, like Flynn being transported somewhere else at Konganji, Nanashi still being dead and is being used as a puppet for Dagda, and that he and Asahi were the ones responsible for the divine powers being freed. This later leads to a sort of meeting between the heads of the Hunters Association, Fujiwara, and Skins. But it's cut short when Maitreya unleashes a seal that prevents everyone from using their comps or using their terminal. Besides Nanashi. We head back to Kinshi Show to help the people with the demon invasion there, and with the help of Toki, we managed to get rid of the seal and defeat Maitreya, with her later joining our group. And all of that is not including some character development that happens, like Asahi's dad dying, and the really weird shit with Toki and Inanna. The next day, after finding a revived Shesa, we end up storming Konganji to save Flynn, leading to a fight with Krishna. We managed to defeat him and later defeat Adramelic for that sweet, sweet revenge. With the divine powers gone, Merkaba and Lucifer end their ceasefire, leading to Gaston having to go back to Mikado. On that same coin, we're given a mission by Fujiwara and Skins to get intel for them, leading us to infiltrate Mikado. Though, during a samurai meeting, the party gets discovered in this drone in jail, where they're later saved by Gaston. After some fights, we make it back to Tokyo, and the next day we head to Camp Ishigaya to stop both Lucifer and Merkaba. After going through the forces, we reach the Yamato reactor where we're given the choice to join either Merkaba or Lucifer. In doing so, ends the game pretty early, but there is some more stuff we need to take care of, like this golden little raisin that's been getting name dropped recently. We end up fighting and defeating Merkaba and Lucifer, despite the latter fight being utterly annoying, and with Merkaba, Lucifer, and the Divine Powers defeated, we end up having a celebration that is again cut short when during Flynn's speech, everyone ends up turning into a lifeless husk. Come to find out, the Flynn that's with us isn't actually Flynn, and what the fuck is that thing? <coughs> this whatever the fuck it is, is revealed to be Seisha, and we'll learn that not only does he get revived and get stronger every time he dies, but he took the form of Flynn in order to deceive us and suck more souls for the cosmic egg. He tries to kill Nanashi, but Asahi sacrifices herself to save him, and Seisha runs off to unalive himself so that he could turn into the cosmic egg. After Krishna's little monologue, we rush into the cosmic egg, defeating Odin along the way, and what might just be the most uncomfortable part of this entire game 
is with Toki, as due to being exposed to this thing called Aether, which really wasn't explained, she turns into her inner demon, Inanna. She brings Maitreya back to life and evolves into Mitra Buddha, and after the divine powers go deeper into the cosmic egg, Nanashi and the others fight through a horde of empowered demons and finally come face to face with Inanna and whoop her ass like it's nothing. We get Toki back and after defeating Mitra Buddha, we make it to Krishna's doorstep where we are told about Dagda's master plan. His plan was to create a new universe where everyone has the freedom to do what they want, when they want, and to turn into our true forms. Nanashi's death and freeing the divine powers became the catalyst to allow him to do so, and afterwards were given a choice to draw away our humanity to create Doctor's universe, or stick with our friends to destroy the cosmic egg. Now, for the case of this synopsis, we decided to destroy the cosmic egg, leading to a fight with Dagda, where he literally rips the life out of you. That's until Dandu creates a new, much less edgy version of Dagda, and you and the others manage to beat him. From there, the new Dagda returns everybody's souls to their bodies and revives Asahi. Also, don't ask if you can bring Akari and Asahi's dad back to life, as for some reason it doesn't apply to them? Eh, whatever. We make it to Krishna where shit starts going 0 to 100 when Krishna fuses with Flynn giving us Vishnu Flynn. Though the fight itself goes from being pretty cool to being the most anticlimactic shit ever with it ending with Flynn breaking away and killing Krishna. With the divine powers finally defeated and there seeming to be no more threats, it looks like things are going to get better and we can finally relax. Is what I would say if there was a certain somebody that gets name dropped early as hell. Yeah, we gotta mention Yahweh. And why the hell does he keep doing that? We end up getting a dream from none other than Steven, and oh fuck, wait, he actually appeared earlier in. Ah, shit. Mmm. So, uh, yeah, you know, Steven is a dang in this story, you know, he's in the background as per usual, but similar to the first SMT where he helped us a bit with the 70 program and stuff, this time he ends up playing a much bigger role in getting us to fight Yahweh. Yeah, he goes on to explain the axiom, which I'm not even going to go into full detail with because that shit is weird. And if you want a TLDR, imagine being able to observe something and give form to something that doesn't have one. Sounds confusing, right? Yep. Well, nonetheless, Stephen gives us a choice to either accept false freedom and be in fear of God, or, and here's another option, kill God and obtain true freedom. And after waking up from the dream, you and the others casually agree to kill God, which at this point just feels normal. We meet up with Steven, who shows us the way to go into Yahweh's domain, and during our trek through it, we end up seeing Walter and Jonathan, who is later revealed to be two halves that make up Satan, spawning a pretty decent design. Okay, I like it, I like it. Satan tests our strength with regards to what ending we choose ends with them joining us to fight Yahweh. We eventually meet the big bad himself, and after drawing some harsh truths at him, we get what might just be the cleanest final boss fight in all of Megaton. This fight is a long one, a very long one, but Nanashi and the others prevail, destroying Yahweh once and for all. Yahweh vows to return while fading away, and the game ends with everyone going their separate ways and Dagda finally returning Nanashi back to life. And I think besides the freedom ending and Nocturne, this is actually a pretty happy ending, though for talking about my thoughts on this story, uh, it's between not being good and being okay at best. To at least get some of the positive stuff out the way, I love the Divine Powers. They're like a more involved version of the Whites and their motives and their means to reach shit makes them pretty decent villains. By themselves though, they're really good as we often see them pull underhanded tactics to get what they want and they're pretty charismatic to boot which is always a plus to me. The pacing was something that I was kind of mixed on as there's not a lot of time to stop and reflect what was going on, but on the other hand though, it was a nice change to get right into the dick of it. Another thing involves some of the characters, with the old ones being so much better than what we saw in 4, and the new characters being pretty cool. Isabu has gotten the best improvement as we actually get to see her do stuff and be less dependent on Flynn for things. Yes, she wants to save him, but in contrast to her appearance in 4, we see her actively involved with shit like saving people, helping the association with moving equipment, and so on and so forth. Then we have Navarre, who is a ghost in this game. And why is Navarre a ghost in this game? Because poom poom, that's why. No, actually he was a pervert, but still. But he's less of a dickhead in this game, and as it continues on, he becomes less and less egotistical, which also makes him a lot more bearable here. 
Finally, for the new characters introduced, I mainly want to talk about Hallelujah and Gaston. Now, despite me saying that Gaston is an amped up version of Navarre, he does actively change throughout the story. Now, the events in Makado humble him so much that he starts reevaluating his worth, but the moment we get to Camp Ichigaya to fight Merkaba and Lucifer, we see him go from having his head up his ass and thinking he's a one-man show, to being more of a team player, just with his signature confidence, and learns that he's still strong even without the spear of Michael. Then we have Hallelujah who was my favorite character throughout the whole entire story. Now, when we first meet him, he is a sharp contrast to the Ashurakai. Instead of being aggressive, Hallelujah is a lot more chill and often tries to avoid conflict. But the events in Mikado changes everything, where we find out that he's half human and half demon, something that he isn't exactly proud of. But the moment we accept him regardless of his heritage, he begins taking ownership of it and actually becomes more willing to fight, especially if you push him far enough. Now, everything else that's great about the story does come from the world building, where we learn more about the day-to-day -day life of someone living in Tokyo, as well as the world of the Hunters, which was nice to see more of, as a contrast to learning more about, you know, Mikado in the last game. Then there's the stuff dealing with the Axiom and Steven, which is a nice expansion to the Megaton universe, even if the explanation for the Axiom flew over my head. Unfortunately, the good things doesn't completely save the story as it's plagued with problems. Now, starting with this game's tone, is as bipolar as Southern Weather. As one moment the story is serious, motherfuckers dying everywhere, and people talking about the way the world should be ran and shit. Then it pulls a 180 and turns into a comedy. Then there's the issue with some of the other characters throughout the story, like Nozomi being completely static and only being there for moments for Danu and Dada. But the worst of it is Asahi and Toki, which begins a small side story involving a love triangle between Nanashi, Asahi, and Toki. Now this would have been okay if it happened once, maybe even twice, though that's pushing it, but every interaction between them leads into that side plot, and it's not even good. Like, yeah, you know, we just killed a god and stuff, why the fuck are we seeing the harem plot going on? Oh, and don't get me started on these two individually. Starting with Asahi, she isn't really as bad as everyone makes her out to be, but god damn is she almost as static as Nozomi. Her main thing is that she wants to try to prove her worth to the people around her, but isn't really able to because compared to everyone else, she's weak. But there is one moment from her where she sacrifices herself for Nanashi, and this would have been a great moment to develop her character and provide some decent changes for her, but instead, we just get a moment after she's brought back to life where she's just like, yeah, I died. And I'm still pretty weak. After that, nothing else besides the whole entire team trying to reassure her that, yeah, she's strong. Even Navarre and Gaston doing the same. Especially Gaston because, well, he hated her when they first met. Now, if Asahi actually accepted that she's still a vital part of the team, then I wouldn't be so disappointed. But as is... It's ass. Then there's Toki, who I thought was going to be a pretty good character, and just he starts calling us master. And this goes on for the entire game, mind you, especially if you have her as your partner. Now, it's later revealed that Inanna, the goddess of love, fertility, and a bunch of other shit, was taking refuge in her body, with Divis and the Cosmic Egg eventually allowing her to take her body over. Now, this moment in her fight is just creepy as shit, and even though she has little to no recollection of her calling Nanashi Master, if you look into the inbox after the fight, she still asks you to call you Master and private. Oh my god! Now, granted, compared to Asahi, Toki actually has some development, learning to find strength within herself after she's free from Inanna, so I guess it's the only one that we can take at this point. And then, there's one last character we need to mention, being Dada. And he's one of the main moving forces of the story, being the catalyst that gets just started with the divine powers. And once you learn his motivations, you would think that the choices would start to have more impact to them. But from the time we meet him all the way to the Cosmic Egg, he does nothing, and I mean nothing, but spout about how we should ditch our friends and create a new universe. This, and the fact that he really doesn't have any character beyond that, makes him the most insufferable character that I've ever experienced in a Megaton game. And mind you, he's even more insufferable than Gaston and Navarre combined. Now, nothing he says goes beyond the I want to create a new universe stick. And sure, it might be unfair to say that, especially since I didn't go through the anarchy ending. But even then, it feels weird to go for that ending when there doesn't seem to be a substantial change to the text to illustrate it. And honestly, if they handle this like a Machin X, where you're playing from the perspective of Machin and we see a conversation between him and Nanashi, this will be a much better dynamic. Though, as is, Dagda is just fucking annoying, man. 
But uh, yeah, uh, to reiterate, this story is... You know what? I changed my mind. I try to see the good in everything. But, yeah, and uh, Apocalypse's story is just not good. Certain characters had better development than others, with those others being largely static. The tone switches would have been nice if they were done in better situations. And despite me saying that the pacing wasn't too much of an issue for me, that's mainly in the gameplay department. In terms of the story, it is way too fast to even stop and think about what the fuck just happened. And the dynamic between Nanashi and Dagda is booty cheeks and only focuses on Dagda's edginess. Though I was invested thanks to the divine powers, the world building, and the fight against Yahweh. But the characters and the tone should have been left in the oven just a little longer so that it could be, you know, more dynamic, if that makes sense. Though what might just be the most funniest twist is that the gameplay is easily the best thing about this game. Unlike 4 where the gameplay was an issue, Apocalypse went and made some considerable changes that arguably makes the gameplay here top tier. And the biggest among all of these changes is the fact that making money is so much easier. Thank fucking god! Relics give out more money and you can actually see how much they're worth when you pick it up. Main quests and challenge quests gives out more money and the latter gives out better rewards, making them a lot more enticing to do. But among all the changes, the biggest one is the changes to the smirk system. Now back in the last game, smirking can easily become the end all be all to a battle for all the benefits that it could give you, but in Apocalypse the system was greatly changed to be a lot more fair. Some of the stuff that changed was not being able to dodge every single attack anymore, not healing your party if y'all all get smirk, and you can now lose smirk if you get a status ailment. Though despite it getting nerfed, you can still do 2 times the damage with magic also being able to crit now, and having any attacks that target your weakness can be treated as normal damage. But alongside this, not only can you smirk more often now, but you also have the means to give yourself smirk or remove it from the enemy. Throughout the game, you'll come across a good chunk of demons that have moves like Magon, which can remove smirk from an enemy, and Smile Charge, which can give yourself smirk even if you have a status ailment. Though thinking about it, that is somewhat broken. And the final thing is that moves have special effects if you use them while smirking. So if you were to use a move like Dunder Gods while smirking, it will pierce through an enemy's resistance, or skills like Mudo and Hama will be able to fully insta-kill. And these changes alone makes battles less annoying to deal with, even if the enemy have a means to, you know, remove smirk or give it to themselves. And speaking of which, there is one other change that luckily the enemy doesn't have, and that is with your partners. Partners work similarly to how they did in 4, they are controlled by AI and they'll take up any press turns, but they were changed to not only have different movesets, but they are also given as bar right here, which fills up after every turn. When it fills itself to the max, your partner can interrupt the enemy's turn to give you an extra hand, and they go all out attack on their asses like a Persona game. And I don't know if this was intentional or not, but the way partners work here becomes more clutch as each character has their own movesets for different situations. Asahi focuses on healing magic, Navar focuses on buffs and debuffs that can use offensive items, Nozomi focuses on gun attacks and status ailments, Hallelujah focuses on support skills that can let you endure a powerful attack or just not gain status ailments, and later on he can use higher level magic and almighty moves. Gaston focuses on physical attacks as well as Toki, though her can, you know, insta kill and shit. And finally is Isabu, who is an all around character that is able to use magic, almighty spells, healing spells, spells, and buffs. Now, despite this game saying that you can use your partners based on your playstyle, it actually works differently, as you're going to need certain partners to make certain fights less annoying. An example will be using Hallelujah for the Medusa fight to make it less annoying with the whole status ailments and shit, or using Asahi for bosses or fights where the enemy is really strong and you need a little bit of sustain. It adds another layer to combat, and when it comes down to the wire, they can come in handy. And before you say anything, yes. The power of friendship is one strong motherfucker. The last change is a relatively small change, but an interesting one nonetheless. Demons now have further affinities for certain moves, and if you give them a move that corresponds to their strengths, it will become more powerful. However, it doesn't affect demon whispering, and if Nanashi were to get one of the strong skills, it would just turn back to normal. Now, this change makes demon fusion more dynamic for the teams we want to make, and just like in 4, I spent way too much time in the Cathedral of Shadows. 
All the other changes made to this game are small, but improves the feel by miles. Movement is more streamlined, and you don't have to look up or down anymore to climb ladders or jump down holes. Challenge quests are automatically given to you and accepted depending on where you're at in the game or what things you do to unlock it. And leveling up gives you app points like usual, but whenever you come across a course, you can report it to the association and take the last amount of points they already had, which the implications of that is kind of fucked up. Yeah, that's basically it. Apocalypse doesn't do anything insanely new, but the changes made makes this more comfortable to play through. Hell, if I had more time, I would easily replay this because of everything in it. Plus, the difficulty is much more balanced, and you can actually tell when things start getting harder instead of it moving up and down like a disjointed road. But how do these changes affect the overall gameplay? Is this game easy? Are the bosses still as difficult as they were in 4? To answer the first question, yes. This game is easier than 4, even with the multiple difficulties Apocalypse does not push you to the hell that 4 did, and the way it flows is also more organized now, as the game is divided between the phases of the moon, and depending on your choices, you might only experience like a portion of it. Now what you do during each moon phase is either going through two major missions or one major mission, with both of them having bosses at the end. Now I could go through all eight phases of the moon, but it isn't really much compared to me talking about the bosses and some of the other unique things that I've come across, but I want to put that on hold for now so that we can talk about the art, music, and the alignment system real quick. And for that matter, let's talk about the alignment system first. Alongside having the Law and Chaos endings, this game also has the Bonds and Anarchy endings. The Bonds ending is if you decide to rock with your friends to defeat Krishna and later Yahweh, and the Anarchy ending is where you say fuck the power of friendship, we're killing Krishna and Yahweh all by ourselves. Now for how you get to these endings, it's all based around the choices you make is again what i would say they actually matter now at this point i'm starting to sound like a broken record the choices that you make don't really have an impact to them and they're more like putting yourself into nanashi's shoes to either be kind or be a dick now the choices don't become important until you make your choice in the cosmic egg and regardless of the choices you made you can still get the ending you want but you're probably going to get a penalty and there's no middle ground with it either if you choose an ending that doesn't coincide with the choices you made throughout the game then you can either lose all your items or demons i.e some bullshit. bullshit now it is great that they lowered the amount of shit to do to get the ending you want but it comes at the cost of disalignment system having no form of death to it switching over to the art and music for this game this one is gonna be easy Ryota Takazuka returns as the main composer for this game, and holy shit is this OSC way better than 4 in my opinion. Everything that I said about the soundtrack for 4 can also be applied here, but add on to the fact that all these tracks has this type of energy that demands your attention. And if you are looking for a soundtrack that gets you hyped to kill God, this is for you. Also, that final boss track for Yahweh, Oh god, that shit is sex to the ears. Art-wise, things are pretty good here. Character designs are great, and the demon designs are actually pretty good. Now, at first, I kind of wanted to roast Doi for making Andre Malik look like this, but after some research, I realized that this is actually how he's typically depicted as. Interesting. Now, another thing, too, is that many of the previous designs done in 4 were made cleaner, and you can really tell with Medusa, Merkaba, and especially for my boy Lucifer, who looks less of a douchebag now. Then we have one of the cutest demons in this game that can give Jack Frost a run for this money, named, uh, okay, you know what, no, fuck that, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that name. But overall, this is a pretty good star for Doi, even though some of his more meh demons are in the next game, and we're in Redux. Oh boy. All right, now all that's left is the shit that I've been through. And before we do that, I gotta talk about a couple things that I missed in my fourth video. Don't worry, it's only two things. The first thing is these hordes of enemies you'll come across. Now these guys are self-explanatory and can be annoying if you're trying to get a move on. But in Apocalypse though, these guys are not only easy as hell, but give a great deal of XP when you beat them, making the early game just a little easier. The other thing that I forgot to mention was the fact that 4 and Apocalypse has DLC. Now I'm not sure exactly the type of stuff you can get in 4 besides story content and a super boss, but in Apocalypse it is split between stuff for grinding and story content. Now, the first half of the DLC is straight up broken, and if you take advantage of it early on, you can turn an easy game 
to an even easier game. They have everything you need to make your playthrough more comfortable, like an area where you can buy demons, an area to grind for XP, incense, and etc. And besides that, I won't say anything more besides to use this either as a last resort or use it at the end of the game, or you're just gonna make it way too easy for yourself. The other half of DLC is actually story related, and two of these actually give you demons for beating them. Now, the first two DLC packs have you find Cleopatra and Mephisto, who are some of the hardest fights in this damn game. Holy shit. I was not expecting these guys to be a pain in the ass, mainly Cleopatra. No matter what you do, she will make sure your demons are dead and make your life a living hell. And the thing about all of these DLC fights is that you don't have a partner with you, so you're going to be suffering alone. Now, I tried my best to beat Cleopatra on normal difficulty, but I can't stand one more battle against her, so for the rest, I ended up doing it on the easiest difficulty. Now, Mephisto wasn't too bad, though I can imagine that he would be a pain in the ass if it was on normal difficulty. Now apparently there's also some additional shit with the Mephisto DLC that I ended up missing and Nope. 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 Fuck that. No. Mm -mm. The next DLC involves you going to Mikado and basically annihilating everyone. However, you only have 25 turns until the demon gene activates, which was something from the ST4 manga which I recommend checking out when you get the chance. Now this DLC wouldn't be so hard and these guys weren't absolute tanks. They can take everything that you have, even with Pierce, and by the time you get to Hugo, you might have your resource depleted because everything is a one and go. Finally is the Messiah in the Diamond Realm, the most well-known DLC and the one that made me really want to play this game. How this one goes is that you have to save all the pro tags from past numbered titles. For the most part, it isn't too bad, but then you have to fight Steven. Yes, Steven is a boss here, and his first phase is a little difficult, but nothing you ain't used to, but the moment the motherfucker gets up, all hell breaks loose. Besides Yahweh, Steven is one of the hardest fights in the game, and deadass counters almost everything you have, but this fight alongside Yahweh has an interesting little gimmick where you can control two parties, one for your team and the other for the messiahs, and damn are they strong as hell. All of their moves have added effects even without smirk, and if you were to get the right setup going, then you'll be able to do upwards to a thousand damage to them. Another thing too is that Yahweh, Steven, and I think Satan also break the level cap for this game. Luckily, there's DLC 2 so that you can break it as well, though the dot of it is wild. And honestly, everything else about this game is very weird for a Mega 10 game. Now, I want to say that this is the first mainline game where I barely had to grind for almost anything. Completing missions gives you a shit ton of XP as well as doing challenge quests, fighting hordes, and bosses. By the time I reached the halfway point in the game, I was close to in like level 70, where normally I would be at like level 50, level 60. And something I found enjoyable here compared to 4 is the challenge quests you come across. A lot of them feel more personal to you since you're a hunter, and some of these are made up of smaller stories that aren't really complete until the end game. And the two that instantly comes to mind are dealing with Maduro and Hiroshi. Maduro's challenge quests deal with him and his cult being a nuisance across Tokyo, and it's later revealed that Maduro was being controlled by everyone's favorite sexual in the window, Mara, and we now gotta castrate him. Then we have Hiroshi, with his challenge quests involving these old niggas called the Patriots. Oh god damn it. The long and short of it is that the Patriots were a group of men who were responsible for summoning the divinities that protect Tokyo and the creation of the Yamato Perpetual Reactor. And if you're curious on who the divinities are, it's these guys. But one of the members, Tamagami, went on to do some heinous shit in order to summon the divinities by taking people that were in death row and using them for experiments. Tamagami and the other members of the Patriots would later die during God's plan, with Tamagami's brain somehow being kept alive 25 years later, and the other Patriots basically being ghosts. Now, Hiroshi's role in all of this is getting revenge on Tamagami for killing his girlfriend who was wrongfully convicted, and this later leads to us fighting and defeating and Nami so that the Patriots could fully pass away. Jesus Christ, it sounds like some shit out of a Metal Gear game. Everything else related to Apocalypse is just stuff that I've seen in 4, mainly the environments you go through. But I will give Apocalypse one thing though. Getting certain items like the black card was so much easier and is especially rewarding because guess what you can buy? The Hino Kagasuchi. Oh, how I missed you so much. Now, the bosses themselves weren't as bad as they were in 4, though Medusa and Lucifer 
Cooper made sure to come back and continue to give me hell. <laughs> Surprisingly, I struggled a bit with Mitra Buddha, the evolved form of Maitreya. He has this thing where after being hit with his weakness, he'll raise his stats, which is just bullshit. But what made me actually almost lose my mind was going through the Cosmic Egg and Yahweh's Domain. These two areas are both similar in the case of being the worst designed dungeons in Megaton, and only being there to pass stuff out for game length. Now, the Cosmic Egg is essentially a labyrinth with big, empty areas and you trying to figure out where the fuck to go next. And sure, this in Yahweh's Domain is the last dungeon, but it puts you through more shit than both of the last dungeons of 4 combined. You have to face the first few bosses, which can be annoying if you aren't prepared. And it's almost like a gauntlet with there being between like one or two places where you can heal, but even then, it's spaced out. And a lot of the things that I want to say about this dungeon can also be applied to Yahweh's domain, which is just a cosmic egg, but more annoying. Depending on your stats, you might be able to get through this dungeon a little quicker, but it doesn't matter because you're probably going to do what I did and try every damn door to see if you're right. Even with a guide, you're going to be confused because of the mental gymnastics that you're going to have to go through to get to the area's bosses, which weren't as bad as the Cosmic Egg, so I'll give them that. But when you finally make it to Satan and beat them, we go directly to Yahweh. And this fight is the hardest among all the Yahweh fights so far in the series. Unlike in Megami Tensei 2 and Shin Megami Tensei 2, Yahweh here has moves that can give him additional buffs, and when he smirks, you bet your ass that he'll murk two or more of your party members. He also resists everything, and the only way to bypass this is with moves that can pierce. And unless you're the pro tag, that's gonna be a tall order. This is the other battle too where you have two parties, and Flint's party is great to have so that you can debuff his ass to infinity. But the moment he gets to his second phase is where he goes from trying to spare you to saying fuck this you're dying. Three skills he'll start using at this point is Mouth of God, which has a chance of insta-killing one person from your party, Planet Chaos, which can give someone in your party a bunch of status ailments, and Miracle, which makes everyone's HP go to 1. Now I hope you're prepared for that because it's gonna be some bullshit when it happens. And as I was going through this fight, I struggled a bit with his second phase, and the best advice I can give is to get some demons with powerful skills and good healing magic, then boom, Yahweh's defeated. And yeah, uh, I honestly don't know what else to say at this point. Just roll the uh, last bit of this video. SMT4 Apocalypse. A game that is divisive to many is often considered to be among the worst Megaton games by some fans. I tried going into this with like zero bias to see whether or not this game is truly as bad as everyone said it was. And you know what? I somewhat agree with them. Emphasis on somewhat, because I still think there's good things about this game. This. Play wise, it's great. The improvements make this a less stressful experience, and while I had issues with the pacing, honestly, I'm still mixed on it, but it was nice to get right into it in the gameplay sense. However, the gameplay didn't save the story for me, because you see, I value a good or at least decent story when I play games, and Apocalypse did not do it for me. The characters were mixed between being good and being meh, and there isn't any time dedicated to digesting what the hell happened throughout the story. And something I didn't mention before is how long it goes for. Now, this game can go on for about 40 to 60 hours, and besides the stuff going on with Yahweh and the Divine Powers, this could have been way shorter. If this was around 20 to 35 hours, it would have been fine, but everything else you do in between could have been outright a minute. Now, the easiest solution for the next game is doing better on the writing, but as you'll see later on, it's gonna get worse. So, so much worse. So, should you play Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse? Mm, I would say maybe, but also play at your own discretion. If you don't care about the story, then I can guarantee that you'll enjoy the game. Now, if you care about the story like I do and it's a make or break for you, then I would just outright avoid it.
With that, thank you guys so much for watching until the end of the video. We only have one game left until we finally end this retrospect that has been going on for almost close to two years now. I did not intend for this shit to run as long as it did. Um, but the next game is the most recent game in the series, Shin Megami Tensei 5. And I have something a little special for it, so make sure to be on the lookout for that sometime or in this month. Like always, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video, as well as pressing the little bell notification so you guys know when the next video is going to be coming out. And make sure to stay safe, wear a mask because it's getting crazy out there. Also, take some time to chill, relax, touch some grass, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!